to bring it to the table. Here at Spencer Cable Access, we wanted to create a space for makers, artisans, creators, farmers, and producers to bring what they make to the table so that we can share it with the community. I am your host, Allison Smith, and I have our wonderful guest here, Kim Michek, who is the owner and operator of Breezy Gardens Family Farm. And I am just so honored and blessed to have her here today. Welcome, Kim. Thank you so much, Allison. Oh, so I, we had an opportunity to go to your farm and get a tour, and I was absolutely blown away. Um, I'm an avid shopper at your store, and I love going there because it keeps me out of trouble. I get all my local veggies there, and I don't get any of the processed foods that we find at the uh, regular market, and not to mention you're local. So you are a true family farm. That is true. <laughs> yes. <laughs> we have. You yeah. are. Yeah. So who else do you run the farm with? So I run the farm, basically my husband, my sister, and myself, and we also have a wonderful God that's worked for us for more than 35 years that um, is my husband's second in command, and that's Donald Bedward. Yeah? Awesome. And it's great. Um, we've divided the chores up into different concentrations, and we work as a team, and it works out pretty, pretty well. It Usually. really does. It really does. You have quite the operation there, and I was actually blown away by how large it is. Yeah, you really only see the tip of the iceberg when you come into the farm market because you just see the end product. You don't see what goes behind in the fields and the production and the greenhouses and how much uh, visual space, geographical space it takes to produce all those things from nothing to a finished product. Isn't that the absolute truth? So how many acres are you farming currently? Well, there's uh, approximately 12 acres where the farm market is. There's 80 acres that we own and farm in Spencer on the Seven Mile River, uh, just off of Route 31. And then we lease, on 10-year lease, another 40 acres in Paxton. And we plant uh, on rotation uh, about 100 acres of that at any one time. That is one season. That is absolutely incredible. So what types of crops do you produce so people can know what kind of wonderful veggies they can get at your store? Well, we do a lot of sweet corn. We specialize in sweet corn. Um, it was delicious, by the way. <laughs> I well, like the butter and sugar. <laughs> it, it's easy to bring good sweet corn in. The challenge is to bring sweet corn in that's delicious and wonderful every day from the 10th of July to we just finished yesterday uh, in a record long season on the 29th of October. Um, and have it be consistently uh, at the right maturity and the high sweetness level that you want to bring it in at. And I got to say, my, my husband's a master at that. So it's a, it's a thing that he does with high precision and scheduling. It's a passion it project, isn't it? It is. It and it your is. sister was saying you pick it fresh every single day. Every day. Yeah. Which we, is we won't hold corn over for sale uh, if it's over 24 hours picked. Will not. Who can say that? Mm. <laughs> Who can say that? Delicious. So. What other crops do you have and provide? Well, if you pick up a beautiful salad bowl, pretty much everything that goes into a salad is grown at Breezy Gardens. If you can grow it at Breezy Gardens, we do grow it at Breezy Gardens. So we have wonderful tomatoes yes, and several different varieties. We have everything from beans to zucchini <laughs> and actually I should say asparagus to zucchini and go with A to Z, right? Right. Um, we, we have great summer squashes and uh, we also grow strawberries, blueberries and raspberries and the small fruits and um, 
Oh yes, we got Just, to try some of your raspberries. They yeah. were delicious. Yeah, I was, yes. I couldn't I couldn't keep you guys out of them in the field. <laughs> it was so great. <laughs> I, I know you had cabbage, and do you really do, when I go in and I have a recipe, and you have wonderful herbs. Oh, thanks, too. yeah. Oh, you, and you we get pick a, fresh every single day. Yeah. I bet you do, and you get a really wonderful bunch. A very generous bunch. Yes, yeah. you do. Yeah. Yes. I'm always telling people how they can preserve the extra because, you know, somebody will pick them up and say, I'll never use this in my recipe. Say, well, you can do this and this and this with it. And yeah, I actually copied what... You did and it kept wonderful, which was putting it in like a, a vase. Oh, yeah. Yes. But if, for example, yeah. if you wish to preserve basil, mm -hmm. um, you throw it in your blender with a little bit of olive oil. Then I have a ice cube tray devoted to this. Oh, I yes. spread the, uh, the basil out into the ice cube tray, put it in the freezer. When it, once it's frozen, pop those out into a plastic bag, and then all winter all you have to do is pop an ice cube of basil into your recipe, and it's, it's wonderful, incredible. fresh flavor. You really are a Renaissance woman. <laughs> and you were mentioning that you had a background in microbiology. Yeah. So I got to ask, what... <laughs> How did I end up in a field? Yes, because, you know, you had the certainty of a nine-to-five, and then no, you went true. to the uncertainty of farming. So could you, could you talk a little so, about that? Um, I grew up on a dairy farm uh, and also um, in a family that valued science and math. Mm. Uh, my dad was a civil engineer. My mother was a science teacher. And I worked on my grandparents' dairy farm here in Spencer for, for many years. Mm. And... Um, my parents really felt that um, no matter what you did in life, you could always carry an education with you and uh, use it in a variety of different ways. And so they really encouraged both myself and, and um, John's parents encouraged him to, to get a higher education. Um, I was working as a microbiologist. Uh, he had a great job with what he was doing. And we really felt the call of farming. Mm. We just loved being able to produce something from nothing, something that people really needed and valued. And uh, we really wanted to go back into farming. So um, we started with a really large vegetable and, and uh, uh, cornfield vegetable garden. Um, and it was a way when we didn't have equipment and we didn't have a whole lot of things to go on um, to get a foot in the door, and we found out we really loved it. He had grown up showing vegetables, and I had grown up showing vegetables. Even though our main interest at the time was dairy farming, yes. um, it was a side project that was encouraged in 4-H, and we started with it and found out we really loved it. And so... Um, Slowly, the farm built up, um, and I had quit in a laboratory. I was selling fruit and vegetables just on a picnic table in front of the house. Amazing. And um, we just built up more and more. We had a couple of small uh, handmade greenhouses that we were growing plants in, and mm -hmm. then a picnic table with a pile of corn, and tomatoes, and squash, and so forth on it. And people really responded to it well. And uh, things built and built until John could actually quit what he was doing and come in. And then things took off with big leaps and bounds from there. Um, interestingly, we rented the land in Spencer that we farm uh, today uh, for, for, for more than 30 years before it was uh, offered to us in private sale and we bought it. And that's your so. family farm, correct? It is not the farm that was my family's okay. farm. It was a neighbor family farm. Okay. It was actually a very, very good friend of my grandfather's. And, that's uh, awesome. The, the whole family was. And, and uh, we had asked over the years when we rented it, if you do ever think it's time to sell, just ask us first. And they did. And it was very wonderful. The small family were very generous in parting with their land, and, and we bought it, and it keeps going from there. 
So this is a true labor of love. It is a labor of love. Uh, if you don't love farming, I don't think you last long in it. <laughs> no, and it really is a lifestyle. It is. Yeah. It's all encompassing, actually. It really is. You, and you had mentioned that your husband, John, was an electrical engineer. Yeah. How on earth did you convince him as well to take this leap of faith? Yeah, in this particular case, I think it may have been the, the other, other way, way around. around. Yeah. Okay, so I think he, uh, he had even more of a burning need to farm. Um, there's, there's one thing um, that anybody knows John knows, that he doesn't hold still for more than a few minutes. And he just, uh, there's one thing about farming, it loves people that don't hold still. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it does. It's, it's so much work. It is. It's so it is. much work. But it's also work that um, changes with seasons. Yes. It changes with weather conditions. So that if you get tired of one thing, that's okay. You're going to be doing something else the next day. So exactly. it's one of the joys of farming if you like to work. So. so let's talk about that. As the seasons change, how does the farm change and what differences does your production see throughout the year? Quite a few. There's mm. actually four solid seasons that we move through. So we start in the spring. Mm -hmm. We have uh, a great deal of greenhouses. Um, we start a lot of our own material from scratch, mm. either seeds or cuttings, um, which is uh, not seen everywhere nowadays. Right. And we bring it right through to full production and have it ready for sale. Mm. Um, one of the things about our place is that because we're growers and sellers, we have uh, the availability uh, to customers to talk about how to grow or what to grow or mm -hmm. what it would combine well and, and how to make things work for them. And I think that's part of our service. Mm. And then uh, we move uh, the, the last week of May right into the vegetable and fruit season. And we start the season with asparagus and strawberries. It's, it's always a great that's, thing to start with yes, something you love, right? Yes. And, uh, and so good for you. And, and salad. Yes. Salad. You know, when you come out of that winter and you're just so tired of of green things that aren't green anymore uh, and you move into that fresh salad and you you know something like asparagus and strawberries who couldn't love but you take that bite of that crisp green mm. fresh salad and it's like oh my god this is so good it and is so good it's amazing really. and fiber is such an important thing that people need to realize as far as the American diet goes that's it, true. It's really kind of what's missing in, in our diets. It's true. And you provide all of that so well. It's, it's easy to talk about something that's healthy for everybody. Yes, it is. And to provide it, and you can feel really good about that. How about some of the fun activities? When we got to visit, you sent us all down the slide, and it was so much fun. And I didn't even, A, I didn't know adults could go down the slide, but I'm so <laughs> glad that they could. But tell me about some of the other things yeah, that you so do as far as agritourism goes. So when we move into the October, uh, well, the last week of September and into that pumpkin season, that harvest season, um, we, we try to come up with a plan for families with young children. And we try to make it so that uh, a family could come together mm. and enjoy a lot of the activities. And we found it, um, I found it interesting that a lot of places don't offer things for children that are two years old. Mm. And they don't offer things for more sophisticated crew. In other words, right. they just aim at one family group, but families are mixed ages. Yes, they are. So we came Kids up of with, all ages. We, we really <laughs> deliberately came up with a plan for Oh, uh, something that would work for a whole group, group and a family that was all different ages. And uh, hopefully we've done that. And I know every once in a while I'll have a grandparent that will come and say, well, I don't really think I'm up for the slide. I say, well, a hay wagon ride, <laughs> a little walk through the cornfield corn so you can remember your, <laughs> what you did when you were a kid. Yeah. Um, you know, there are other things and you'll enjoy just watching your grandchildren light up. And it's, it's a fun amazed. activity. I was amazed at how much you provided our community. 
Oh, that's a, that's a nice thing. We started, strangely, we started with the activities that we do in the fall in response to um, schools asking us if they could do field trips. Isn't that awesome? And we did that for many, many years. This time, we kind of retired out of the field trips. Perhaps I don't have the energy I used to have for 63, three-year and four-year-olds, but I always loved it. It was something I just, you know, really looked forward to, and I do kind of miss it. I just, just I'm not up to it as much as I used to be. And then, uh, you know, as soon as you think you're, uh, you're up and running and everything's going smooth, it's the 30th of October, and you're getting ready for the Christmas season. Exactly. So, um, Tell us about that. Uh, my <laughs> sister and I uh, specialize in homemade wreaths, garland, and arrangements. Um, we do have Christmas trees, but um, the thing that I think we specialize in is uh, coordinated groups like a, a garland with a matching ribbon that goes with your wreath and you know maybe an arrangement for the front porch that Ooh. kind of thing and we do a lot of custom work for folks and um, just people seem to find that that work really hard to locate these days. So. I just love a matching set. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> right? Yeah, something something that works all the way around for the whole house. So that's awesome. So you were a fully operational farm all year round. Yeah, and then in uh, the winter, something we never did before is we do the Winter Box Club, which we started in response to the HIP program. Tell so, us more about the HIP pro program. What so does that, that stand for? The, it's an acronym for Healthy Incentive Program. And it is, um, it is something that the state of Massachusetts, unlike any other state in the United States, adds on to the SNAP program. They add on if you have a SNAP card, an EBT card, and you um, wish to spend extra time and effort to get fresh produce at a local farm that participates in the program, you get extra money on your EBT benefits every month that the state of Massachusetts donates uh, to uh, spend at a local farm. And it's great. Most people get uh, between $40 and $120 a month extra to spend if it's on fresh produce. That is so exciting. It really is. It really is exciting. Yeah, it is. Um, and one of the movers and shakers behind that program is a, a Spencer home, home person, uh, Ann Gobi, was one of the first people that came up with that. Hopefully we can get her on the show. <laughs> <laughs> so let's talk about why families would want to shop locally, specifically at your farm. You had talked about integrated crop management. Right. So I thought maybe you could talk a little bit more about why your produce is more healthy than what you would get at the regular grocery store. So when we started farming, mm -hmm. um, late in the 1970s, early in the 1980s, um, the concept of organic was just really uh, starting to roll. Right. And Again, background in engineering and science, environmental science, um, we were looking at the type of farming we wanted, wanted to, to do. do. And when I looked at organic, I thought, gee, the only people that can truly afford organic are either the folks that are so poor they can't afford anything, or the folks that are rich, and by that I mean if you drive your own car, you're rich. Right in terms of a world economy. Absolutely. Um, so I said, well, gee, what is a better way of growing? Mm -hmm. And at the time, the University of Massachusetts and the University of Connecticut were first coming out with this idea of integrated crop management. Mm -hmm. And it's a method of growing that uses as many organic methods as you can. Yes. But you combine it and look at it with a new way of approaching the problem in that uh, you can use science and you can use 
uh, organic methods. So um, examples of that would be, uh, uh, most people always say, how can you grow corn organically? Right. And the answer is you either get to like earworms a yes. lot, <laughs> or <laughs> the only other viable method I've heard, and I, I use viable very loosely, yes. is to use vegetable oil on the silks of every single ear. Right. And the only way I know to put that on is by hand. Right. And if you're growing 34 acres of corn, right. it's not as viable as you wish it was. Of course. So um, the way we do it is we have pheromone traps. And we put those pheromones up, traps up in the field, and we monitor them every single day. And the moth that causes earworms, mm. uh, the, they lay their eggs in only a three-day cycle. So once you're watching those traps, the moths are attracted to the traps by the pheromones. Mm. And when they enter the traps, you say, ah, that's when you must run out and apply one spray. And if you apply it at the right time, in the evening, so you're not hurting the bees, because mm. the bees have stopped flying at twilight, uh, and you apply it then, you will get 95% protection on your corn, which we deem a very acceptable way of protecting a crop. Now, sometimes we never have to apply it because there's no moss in the trap. Right. But when we get more than three moss in the trap at a certain maturity level, then we go out and we apply that one spray. Isn't that an ingenious system? It is. It really it, is. It, it needs a fair amount of education to mm. figure it out. It needs... Um, Persistence and vigilance. Uh, there was one time this summer when we finally got two days away from the farm, and it was very rare. Yes. And we got a call from our scout. Uh, yes. And we <laughs> had to run all the way back on our precious two days because now was the moment. Yes. <laughs> you couldn't pass it up. You had to come back and treat that corn that moment. So diligent. So, so much discipline. Yeah, it's gotta, you've yes. got to be on top of it. You do. Yeah. Moss are kind of like our arch nemesis, aren't they? <clears throat> They're not <laughs> pleasant to find in an ear of, uh, ear of corn. No. You don't like it. No. <laughs> Nobody does. So that's the kind of thing we do. Uh, and every crop is different. Yes. So again, it needs a lot of background. It needs a lot of work. It needs a lot of research. Um, another crop that we do a lot with is tomatoes. Yep. And do you know what an indeterminate and a determinate type of tomato is, Alice? No, no, I do okay. not. Please educate us. Okay. So... <laughs> An indeterminate type of tomatoes is what most home gardeners grow. Yes. They're a type of tomato that ripens the first cluster. You pick it, it ripens the second cluster. It keeps going. It yes. keeps going. Yeah. They may get a little smaller. Right. But you can keep picking those tomatoes for a long time. Right. A determinate type of tomatoes produces all of its load of tomatoes, everything it's going to produce in less than two weeks. Gotcha. I'm going to take a quick sip. Please. Thank you. <clears throat> Anytime. So <laughs> We're just chit-chatting. We're yeah. having a little tea here, huh? So what we do for tomatoes, tomatoes don't have a lot of insect problems. Right. What they have is disease problems. Yes. Yes, they do. So what we do is produce multiple batches of tomatoes that we plant in different parts of the farm mm -hmm. at different times. Mm. And therefore, about the time disease becomes a problem for that batch of tomatoes, we're done with it. It's getting ah, old. It's getting geez. tired. Now as disease can take a foothold. Mm -hmm. We move out of that and onto the next batch. Keeping the determinate tomatoes. Yep. Amazing. It works very, very well. <clears throat> it, it really cuts down on the... You have the most beautiful tomatoes. Oh, thanks. They really are perfect. <clears throat> They, they, I got to say, this year, they have really, truly been exceptional. Yeah. Oh, yeah. amazing. I mean, other years, they're 
stressed a little bit by drought or whatever, but this year that water has done good things to those yes. tomatoes. <laughs> Happy a good tomatoes. Crop. Good yeah. crop for this year. Yeah. Do you um, notice anything as far as like climate change <laughs> goes, um, being a farmer in our community? Well, let me say that we have been in business for 44 years and we <clears throat> broke a record for how many days we picked corn this year. We finished yesterday, it's the 30th of October, yes. and we finished picking corn on the 29th of October. We've come one other time close. Uh, we, I think we made it to the 26th one time, but never in the first 20 years of farming. It always finished by 1st of October. Right. So we are definitely seeing climate change. Yes. And <clears throat> sometimes it works against you. For example, um, just the consistent high heat of summer and working in it, right. uh, you know, really has become a concern in how many hours you can spend in the sun, how many hours you work in the middle of the day. We switch our schedule around, so we start a lot earlier. We take a, a siesta, if you will, in the middle of the day uh, because the, the heat has become a, a true concern. And, you know, we really didn't see that. And you'd have a short, hot, hot spell, but you didn't see it consistently for week after week. Exactly. And, you know, that has changed. Other things that have changed are um, the amount of pests that now winter over. Mm. Because those wonderful mild winters where we don't have to shovel a lot of snow. Right. You know, we see not only insects have become a bigger problem than they used to be, but we're seeing uh, a much increased pressure from uh, critters, and by that I mean coyotes and right. bear and raccoons, and uh, they don't lose as many babies over the winter, mm. and all those babies are out there hungry looking at our crops going, yumma, yumma, mm. yumma, yumma. Uh, just like we look at it. Yes. <laughs> um, and so we've, we've had more problems with that than we have ever had in past years and early years of farming. Yes. So, yeah. yeah, I think people don't, because uh, they're usually in climate control, they don't understand what uh, stress extreme temperatures can be, especially it's, on crops and it sometimes animals creates, and humans. It sometimes creates um, uh, those moments where you have to quietly smile. <laughs> Because you're talking to somebody and, and they'll say something and you think to yourself, uh, somebody asked me uh, today about, um, well, my chrysanthemums are going by. And I'm like, it, you know, that's because we haven't had a frost yet. And you usually don't expect chrysanthemums to have to work all the way into November. Exactly. So they usually work good for the fall season, but if you stretch the fall season out, they maybe don't quite make the end of the season. Um, right. and, and because you work in it every day, because yes. you're out in that weather every day and you're aware of what's happening outside and you're aware of seasonal changes, it sometimes creates little amusements where you think, <laughs> you know, if you worked outside, you'd be aware of that. So I was in your nursery buying flowers, and I had a llama on my coat, and we became fast friends <laughs> because we love camelids, which include alpacas, llamas, and camels. So <laughs> That's you, right. you also have animals, don't you? We do. We have um, <coughs> a lot of little goats. <laughs> They're so cute. <laughs> they are. And at one time, I had a lot of llamas. I was breeding llamas, we were showing llamas, we were um, doing the shearing, um, and I love textiles, and my, um, I laughingly say that um, working with textiles and llamas is my agriculture hobby that doesn't make money, but I always question whether any agriculture makes money. <laughs> you know, we try our best. But um, you're not alone. It's uh, nationwide. <laughs> I, I'm aware. <laughs> well, but you know what I've been considering myself is a farmist, a farm artist, ah, farmer um, artist. So the artist piece is more in the power of my own selection and being able to create what 
what I want to create. And it seems like you also uh, create. So yeah. tell me, and I know from having alpacas as well that you have this wonderful fleece. And so what do you do with your llama and alpaca fleece? Well, I, I brought some rugs to show you. There's, of course, a rug on the table. And there's <laughs> rug behind us that's Yay. actually a story rug about um, my extended family and agriculture um, expositions or fairs of the summer. Oh, tell us about it. Oh, you want to hear some of the stories? Yes. Uh, I know you'll run out of time if I tell you all the stories. <laughs> okay. But um, you can... You can see the uh, couple sitting on the show box there. My husband and I met at a uh, 4-H state show. So, so that's you and John? That's John and I. John and I. John oh, and I at right. the fairgrounds. Uh, that's, uh, we met at 4-H fair, in, uh, Worcester County 4-H fair. So that's John and I. Um, a match made on the, the farm. The, the <laughs> <laughs> dead center into the little tent is my um, great aunt, Carol Andrews, who was very, very active in the town of Spencer, and my grandmother, Barbara Adams, and they used to run the dairy desk at Spencer Fair. Uh. Um, so that's, that's them. Um, my daughter, and um, she's on the, with the llama at the <clears throat> fairground showing her animal. My husband with his wonderful ash here calf. Um, the, the beginning story is quite dramatic. It's the one that says 1938 Big E. So um, my grandfather was a herdsman for the Eldercrest farm here oh, yes. in Spencer. Yes, I'm, yeah, I'm, yeah, I've heard of the name. has become the uh, basis of where the Abbey is now. Um, yes. I'm, I'm hoping maybe they might let us in there to see some of their jams and <laughs> such. <laughs> Fingers crossed. <laughs> and uh, so he was uh, he tra was traveling with his um, elder brother-in-law, who, who was the head herdsman, and they had a show string that was traveling the country in custom uh, Pullman car with the herd from Eldercrest. And they ended the season at the Big E. <clears throat> and they were there in 1938 in the brand newly constructed Mallory Arena when <clears throat> a hurricane, which didn't, was not pre predicted with the kind of accuracy that they predict now, no. um, <clears throat> traveled up the Connecticut River Valley and hit them about high noon on the fairgrounds. Um, picking up the brand new huge uh, seating for the races, mm. which was packed with people and sending thousands of people uh, spinning on the high rise seating like it was a <gasps> matchstick, like pick up the sticks. People were just, and they didn't have the type of emergency response that no. we have now. So, um, <clears throat> the first thing the folks in the barn knew, um, they knew a storm was starting to come up and a huge gust of wind hit the end of the building and blew all the glass out of the end wall of the building of the Mallory Arena and knocked it all over the cows and the, um, the people in the barn. And um, they were trying to get the animals settled and pick up the glass. And <clears throat> it was raining and it was blowing and they were wondering the building was going to hold. And then uh, the eye of the storm went right over the barn. So it was dead silence and they, they thought they were done. Over. <clears throat> and then it hit the other end of the barn and blew out the other wall of glass. Um, and so um, they're trying to get through all that and uh, all of a sudden a fireman uh, came to the door of the building and he said, the river's coming up, get out while you can, men. And he intended them to leave all the animals and leave. And some of the guys did, they just took off. Uh, but a few of the herdsmen decided, you know, they were gonna try to save some of these animals. And so they, um, they strung all the animals together in big long lines and they walked them to 
a bridge mm. over the river, and it was high enough, and they brought all the animals and shoved them on, and then they spent two nights on the bridge praying that they weren't going to be drowned in the water that was still rising and then <sighs> falling, waiting for it to fall, milking cows that were jammed together leg to leg <gasps> because if they hadn't, the animals would you know, could have sickened and died. Of course, yeah. And uh, they strapped themselves to the uh, railings of the bridge to sleep because they couldn't, there wasn't anywhere else. They couldn't lay down on the ground because there were animals all around them. Right. And uh, when, I, when I started to make this rug, I, I wanted to know more about the story, and I researched all old newspaper articles and found two articles that mentioned the heroic efforts of these men that saved some of these animals. So this isn't just art, this is history. It was fascinating. Yeah, and fascinating. when I first looked at it, I didn't notice all of this beautiful gray cloud work, but that is your depiction of the storm. The storm. And even now to this day, it is important to have um, animal evacuations in emergency situations because if we have a plan, it's not a crisis. Yeah. So no. it's important even now people to this first, day. People first and then... Of course. You have we to. We have the evacuation plans for people, but not... We don't have it very for well animals. for animals. Yeah. It's true. And so something to think about. Okay, so I'm looking at this now, and you have a full scene here that you designed. So could you tell us a little bit of your process from how it goes to this story scene to a rug? Yeah, so um, the first thing I do is sketch it out. Okay. Um, I either use colored pencils or I paint mm -hmm. a scene to get the color ideas that I want. I'm not particularly very good at drawing and painting, mm -hmm. but it helps the process for me to move along and get color ideas and, and sketch out uh, proportions. Mm -hmm. And then I move that from that to the fabric with a cartoon sketch. This is a rug I did of, I'm going to hold it up so I'm going to be disappearing behind the rug. <laughs> but this is one I did of the guys that work for us and my husband picking beans. And I move from... Um, Gorgeous. Thanks. So I move from uh, a cartoon sketch I go right from that into pulling loops to get the idea. I'll lay out some of the colors, and um, I do a lot of my own dyeing, as you probably can pick up by the shading. Um, I dye my own wool, so um, that helps get my colors where I want them to go. And uh, then, then you just do the work. Yeah, and I, I love it because it's my own schedule. Yes. Farming, um, if you're late, mm. it's probably not going to happen. Right. You have to do it at a time schedule, yes. and it's very driven, yes. time-driven. Right. So being able to do something that I've, hey, you know, I don't feel like it tonight, mm -hmm. and I can just put it down and not work on it, or I'm, oh, this is going really great, I can go, you know, and work longer on it. That's really nice for me. I like to be able to have that... Um, way to move time, so to speak. Yeah, and when you don't have the time constraints, it, it goes from being stressful to actually Enjoyable. a stress relief, right? It's so true, it's so true. So how did you learn how to do this? Well, that's a really good question, <laughs> yes. actually. Um, so the, my, my, my great-grandmother, great yeah. um, Edith Kenward Adams, mm -hmm. she did rug hooking. Mm -hmm. and She did? She did. So you grew up and seeing this? Okay. Interestingly uh, <laughs> enough, <laughs> okay. she did, but she her work was not around because it was spoken for. It was bought before she ever finished ah, it. Ah. I can see why. She was quite an artist. Um, and then my grandmother on my dad's side did rug hooking. Mm -hmm. And then my mother-in-law was a fabulous rug hooking artist. The funny thing is, I can't remember any of them ever sitting and showing me how to rug hook. But I feel that somebody must have when I was a very little child because the first time I ever sat down and said, I'm gonna to try to do this, I almost 
felt like it was instinctive. I knew how to do it right away. They all followed patterns that were pre-printed on the fabric. And first one that said, I want to go and do what I want to do, uh, you know, from start to finish. I want to create something uh, from the very beginning to the end that's all me. And, and even to the dyeing of wool, I want to make the colors I can find myself. So um, that's probably a little different from my background, but I had a lot of family influence in the type of rug hooking that I do. The punch hooking, which I do with my llama camelid wool. Let's, let's see it. Uh, yeah, let me pick this up. Let's see. This is um, a seasonal series of my husband in the cornfield because we spend so much of our life in the cornfield. So this is John in oh. the spring. Oh, geez. yeah. This is John in the spring planting corn and a little corn's coming up in the background. Wow. And then I'm, I did that for spring. And then this is John picking corn. Now these have a different texture. Yeah. They're very soft. Oh, very, they very velvety like, soft. Yes, they are velvety yeah. soft. And this is John picking corn. And then the last one, which is actually my favorite, and oh. the one I started with, who knew, right? This is um, John in the cornfield in the fall when the corn's been cut to the stubble. Yes. And this is all I love the punch colors. hooked. And punch this hook. is with the fiber textiles from my llamas yes. that I carded and spun and <gasps> dyed and then made these rugs from the designs that I worked with. That is absolutely so that's incredible. that's where you get that incredible. incredible soft velvety feel. The camelid fiber, as you know, is just incredibly rich to the touch. It it's is. It's just lovely. I always say that it feels like heaven. <laughs> yeah, it feels soft and cushy like a cloud. It's it does. amazing. It yeah. does. It yeah. really, really does. So this is punch hooking. This is punch hook. And this is traditional ho hooking. Ho hooking. Yeah, traditional hooking. Yeah. Incredible. And you yeah. do it so all. So this you work from the back. So the okay. back's as pretty as the front. Oh my fact, God, it really is. It almost looks even, like embroidery almost. It kind of looks like, or tapestry, yes. yeah. Right. Yeah, it, so you work this from this side and then you flip it over and, and walk on the other side, basically. Dare uh, I, although this is reversible. Dare I ask how long this takes you about to do? Yeah, you can ask, but I'm not gonna answer because you it's many hours, many, um, many oh, hours. Countless, not to mention the but you production don't of the fiber. You don't count them because yes, you enjoy you them. Yes. So if you went skiing, does somebody ask you how many hours do you spend on your skis? Correct. Or how much time do you spend on your skis versus the lift or versus the car driving to the slope? You don't ask that because it's all something you enjoy. And you don't count it because it's things you enjoy. So... This is what I feel. This is creative for me. It's something I create. I, I don't have to uh, pay attention to what's going to sell this year in color. Right. I can pick whatever I want and work with whatever I want. And uh, I think it, it makes a difference in how it's, it ends up being when it's something that you let your soul work with. These are absolute masterpieces. Oh, thank you. <laughs> they thank really you. are. So um, when you love something, you don't work a day in your life kind of si so situation. True. It's not work, it's enjoyment. Yes. Yeah. So um, just to wrap this um, wonderful discovery up, I, I, I bet a lot of people don't know you even do this. Well, that's probably true. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm blessed to have found out just by having a llama on my coat. Um, but maybe you can tell us a little bit of the history of how this kind of got popular in America. Well, of course, uh, colonial American, most Americans didn't have the ability to afford 
something as luxurious as an uh, imported rug. And this I is mean, exactly... Think about it. They didn't have the money to buy imported tea. They sure didn't have the money to buy imported rugs. And this is exactly what this feels like. It, it feels like a high-end carpet. A Persian rug. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It does. And so... Um, it's a magic carpet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, sometimes. It yeah. lets your imagination fly anyways. Um, so um, they were trying to find economical ways to create something to cover the floor. Mm. And uh, rug hooking in particular is a Massachusetts colony, and in particular the area along the coast of Maine, uh, but wider across New England too. Um, a craft that largely women, although um, there were several shops that were run by men, would create rugs that were affordable to common people of the time. And they had, uh, wool was one of the two main fabric textiles they had, mm -hmm. wool and cotton. And uh, they would use every little scrap. And with rug hooking, you take little scraps of wool and you cut them up and you pull those little scraps from the back through to the front and leave them looped on the top. And that's what what became the craft that we know now today. Yeah. So I, I also belong to a guild that um, loves to teach anybody. If anybody that's watching wants to learn, you can get a hold of the... Uh, I bet, I bet, that guild. Yeah. I bet there are. I, I want to learn a little bit too. Um, and not to mention, you are not only uh, immortalizing your husband, but you're also telling the farm history of our community. I, I love being able to include farming and, and uh, reflect back images of farming. Is, farming is an interesting uh, endeavor that it's so visually friendly to to our community and does so many wonderful things on so many levels to our community. The farm in Spencer is under agriculture preservation, so it will remain a farm and remain open land forever. So I, I'm thrilled to know that, really. Kim, I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for everything that you do for our community. Thank oh. you so much for coming in today. Well, thank you so much for having me here. I've enjoyed it. Yay. Thanks. Thank you so much for joining us here at Bring It to the Table. We'll be coming back at you real soon with more wonderful guests who are going to show you all of the amazing creations that they're doing right in your backyard. Thanks for joining us.